I'm going to take a vote. Does the four-year look better today than it has the last few weeks with the drop claw? I, I thought maybe we ought to rehang the drop claws. What do you think? No? Huh? Amen. I, I, I just don't have enough words to say my, speak my appreciation for all those who uh, participated in doing that. Uh, and I know I'll leave somebody out, but Travis and Crystal and John and Leanne and um, Tim, the carpet man. <laughs> he, uh, the carpet we ordered didn't come in, and he said, we're going to have new carpet down for Easter one way or the other. So uh, what do you do with people like that, huh? Thank you. Thank you. And it just looks so good and exciting out there. And you know, the one thing good about, I've learned about serving coffee before church is people are here on time better. <laughs> you don't get hung up over it somewhere else having a cup of coffee talking. You can come here and talk. The only problem is somebody told me we're going to have to enlarge the foyer out there now to have more room for fellowship. What a good problem. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate you being here. I really do. Uh, I, I would remind you of uh, John Kelly's service tomorrow, viewing here at 11 to 1, the funeral at 1, and I just appreciate you coming. I miss John greatly. What a great legacy he, has, he and Diana were a part of this church and what they've done so much and so faithful. It's just a true friend true friend. It seems like there was something else I was supposed to do and I can't think of what it is. I am delighted to have my whole family with me today. Travis, Kalea, and Keith. <clears throat> so if you have your Bible with you, I want you to open to Psalm 119. One of the things that's... Uh, I'm not a real traditional guy, so I'll start the sermon by saying John 11:25. 25, Jesus said unto him, I'm the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me shall not die, and I believe that, do you? So today I want to call this, I've titled my sermon, Resurrection Reset. I feel like that everybody needs a reset button in their life anybody here know anything about wanting to reset some things ever huh? resurrection day and because of jesus conquering death hell and the grave he has given us an ability to when we put our faith in him and to trust in him to just reset our lives now i want you all to pardon me just a moment but as i look around i see so many of you that i haven't seen in a while and just good to see so many of you and i love you i, I don't know what else to say i love you i don't want to preach at you but i'm really glad you're here I'm really glad you're here today and i really believe that god has something for us when I talk about resurrection reset, how many of you understand that real lasting change is something that has to take place or happen in your heart? If it's not in your heart to change, if it's not in your heart to do something, you're, you're not going to follow through and do it very long. So today is... is a little bit of a, a heart issue. I, and, and I'm not just talking about your behavior, even though I'll talk about behavior. I'm really interested in talking about our hearts. But if you don't change your belief about something, you're not going to change. If you believe that you're doing okay the way you are, and you believe that, and you believe that it's okay to be the way you are, 
then you're going to continue to do what you're doing and be in what you're being. As long as it's okay and you believe it's okay, you're going to not become everything God intended or purposed you to become. Now, I want to make it clear and right up front, all I really am after and all I'm really called to do of God is to challenge you, to challenge you to allow God to make you everything He designed and intended and purposed you to be. Jesus came... And he came, as the story just told us, as a sacrificial lamb. And as a lamb, he came to offer the sacrifice for the sins of the world. So all of the sins that you and I have ever committed or ever will commit were laid on Jesus, and he offered his life as a lamb. He didn't just die for us, he died as us. The day he went to the cross, Stuart Farley went to the cross... All my sins went to the cross with him, and he died as if he was me. He died as if he were you. He took our sins. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's got something good for our lives to be. In the book of Psalm 119 and verse 112, this this is a long book. Psalm 119 and verse 112, it says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. This word incline, he's saying, I've inclined my heart. Now remember, change only happens when you make up your mind that you're going to change your belief system and allow it to happen in your heart. The reason we give our heart to Jesus is because we want Him to take our lives. We invite Jesus to come into our hearts. I know I've told it thousands of times, you've heard me tell it, but the favorite way to do it is the doctor's listening to the little boy and he puts his stethoscope on his uh, chest right here and he says, I think I hear Barney in there. And he said, no, that's Jesus. Barney's on my shorts. (laughs) Jesus Christ, by His Spirit, comes to live in our hearts. Sometimes, if we're not real careful, we don't give Him the opportunity to do what He wants to do living in us. He has decided that He wants to take up His residence on the inside of human beings. And when we say, I'm a child of God, I'm born of the blood of God and the Spirit of God, we're saying that Jesus Christ has come to live in my heart. And it's a very powerful thing. Here the psalmist says, I have inclined, I'll just notice it doesn't say reclined. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes. Inclined means it's not a natural position for you to be inclined. It's something you have to choose to do to incline. In other words, Your normal thing is to just be there, but to incline means you have to perform. You have to step up. You have to act upon it. So I act upon my attitude. In other words, I begin today by saying to everyone, we need to incline our heart to the Lord. We need to take the attitude of God. I want you living and abiding in my heart. By the way, you, you do know that you are the one in charge of your heart. You know, when I was 49 years old in 2001, I had a heart attack. And the doctor looked at me and said, you're going to have to take better care of your heart. And I'm thinking, I'm in charge of this. I, I, I need to understand what the ramifications are. I need to understand what's involved. And all of us need to understand that, uh, you, you know, 
you're in charge of your heart. Now, my question today to us is, on this Easter Resurrection Day, is your heart set and inclined in a divine direction? Have you inclined your heart to perform the statutes of the Lord? In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it, out of your heart, spring the issues of life. Does anybody here have any issues with their life? Well, the problem is a heart problem. Our heart determines so many things about us. I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. I'm talking about the core of our being, the center, what we believe. If you believe you're okay the way you are, if you believe you're getting by, if you believe that everything's okay just for you to be the way you are, then, then, then that's the way it's going to be. But if you incline your heart to the Lord, you're going to find out that there's more for your life. You know, I personally believe that your habits create the condition of your heart. When I had the heart attack, one of the things the doctor says, what are you doing? And, and, and of course, the, the doctor that I had here looked at me and he says, you know, stress is a killer. You're allowing stress to live in your heart. You're allowing things to bother you and get on you and deal with you. And you, you've got to learn how to lay that down. You've got to learn how to set some things aside. You've got to learn how to be a certain way or your heart and the habits that you have of doing what you're doing, if you don't make some changes, you're not going to be here long. So I realized that I had to do some things in my heart. The next verse here in Psalm 119, verse, four, or verse 113 says, I hate double-mindedness, or the double, I hate double-minded, but I love your law. Now, when I began reading this and I heard that statement, I hate the double-minded, I began to look at it and I realized he's not talking about a person. He's not talking about an individual. What he's actually saying is, I hate double-mindedness. Double-mindedness is something that God hates. Now, let me say this, hate is a very powerful word. Because I have some parents who teach their kids that you ain't supposed to use certain words, I have to be careful the words that I choose. Are you with me? Hate is not very pastoral. But that's the word that is here. If I could say it to you like this, maybe you'll understand what I believe the Holy Spirit's trying to say to us, and that is, in order for us to change some things in our heart, there are some things we should hate that's in there. Pastor, what do you mean? If you don't hate self-pity, you're going to remain to feel sorry for yourself when it doesn't go the way you think it ought to go. The only way I know to get rid of it is to decide you're going to hate it. You got to, because as long as it's okay for you to have self-pity, you're going to... Now, for those of you that are visiting with us today, I, I, instead of picking on any of you, I'll pick on me, Okay. There are times I'd like to feel sorry for myself. Y'all ever deal with that? You know, you get excited, you want something to go a certain way, you think something ought to be a certain way, and if you're not real careful, you'll have self-pity. But he said, I hate double-mindedness. And then he says, I love your law. And so I understand that there are some things I hate. Now let me try to set this up in a way that will help you to understand what I'm trying to say this morning. There are some things that I hate. 
I want to talk about some things that I hate that need to go to the cross and something new be resurrected, but there are things that's in our lives. I love what it does for me, but I hate what it does to me. Let me say that again. I love what it does for me. Self-pity can sometimes make me feel so warm and welcome. But I hate what self-pity will do to me. Let me kind of say it to you like this and you'll get it. I love what ice cream does for me. I want to tell you all that ice cream has been my comfort in the midnight hour and I could call on chocolate ice cream when nobody even cares whether I'm alive or dead. And ice cream, especially chocolate, it don't even matter what brand anymore. You know, I was into briars and then graters. And I, you know, I, 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 man, I'm the cheap stuff just as good. It'll comfort you. <laughs> I love what it does for me, but I hate what it does to me. <laughs> you, are you getting the picture? Huh? Now follow me. So, <clears throat> I can always call on chocolate ice cream when I'm in need. And what it does for me comforts me and soothes me. Y'all understand that? So I love it, but I hate what it does to me. I love anger. It's amazing what you can get people to do if they know you're angry or mad or upset. It's amazing what people will do when you get angry and you begin to show that anger. It's amazing what it will do. If you want to get the job done, there's times that nothing can get it done like anger. I want it done, and I want it done now. I love what it does for me. But I don't like what it does to me. Because the people that you get angry with will avoid you, and it'll make you lonely. Don't you hate being around angry people? Oh man, they're angry at everything. They get angry, they get upset. And, 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 and they, 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 it does something for them. But it also does something to them. I have a very complicated relationship with complaining. There are days... And there are times when I love to tell somebody what I think, how I feel, what they did, what happened. Am I talking to anybody here? I mean, there are times that nothing will satisfy you like complaining will satisfy you. Someone comes up and says, how you doing? And I'm thinking, am I going to put on my happy Christian face or I'm going to tell you how I really feel? <laughs> Do you all know what I'm talking about? Am I talking to anybody here today? Yes. Huh? I mean, you know, when you're around certain people, it's amazing to me that I watch people. If I'm in the grocery store, I see somebody, I watch them and watch how they handle themselves and I see them and all of a sudden I walk up and, Hi, Pastor. Praise the Lord, it's good to see you. And you know, 
15 seconds ago, you was over there, where is that stuff? I've seen that crap here somewhere. <laughs> and then it's, praise the Lord. How you doing? They change this store every time I come in here. Y'all know they do, don't you? Every time you come in there, they change that store. It used to be here. This is where it belongs. Don't they know they needed somebody like me to come here and tell them where this stuff belongs? I worked in a grocery store 40 years ago. I know what it is. I think they move it just so you'll look and see something else you want. No don't matter. The problem with being a complainer is when people see you coming, the next time they see you coming, they go the other way. Is that right? Why? Because... I love what complaining does. It makes me feel so good sometimes to get it off my chest. I'm just being honest. One of the greatest things I learned, we went, we, Sheila and I was married, had little kids, and we, she came in one day and she goes, you're a workaholic. We're going to a marriage seminar. And I thought, huh. Does she not know that I'm an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, and that I sit in the office every day and I fix marriages all over the place? I can fix marriages. I marry couples. I can tell them what to do, and I know what to do to fix marriages. And she said, you're going or I'm leaving. <laughs> and I went, and I realized, you know, <clears throat> It really kind of set me free because she didn't want me to fix our marriage. She wanted to talk to me about how she felt and she wanted to be married to somebody who understood. Listen to me, men. She wanted to be married to somebody who she could talk to and tell how she felt, whether it was right or wrong, and not correct her or discipline her, but just sit there and say, I love you, honey, it's okay. I learned that and I come home and... Some of you have heard me tell this. I come home, we come home to this marriage seminar, and, and, and I'll tell you how long ago it was. It was, you know, we had a flip on TV, you know, in a console. You pulled the button for it to come on, and then I had a VCR on it that you ran up to it, and a wire coming to a remote control, which you had the wire. You understand you could change channels, but you had to get up to turn the TV off because you could turn the VCR off, but you couldn't turn the TV off. So we come home from that marriage seminar and I come in one day and sit down in the recliner, turn the TV on, had the newspaper and she come in. She said, can I tell you something? I said, yes, honey, you sure can. Just a minute. And I folded the newspaper up, put it down, laid my potato chips down, got up and walked over and turned the refrigerator, the t refrigerator, the TV off. <laughs> turned the TV off, sat down and looked up at her and she goes, what are you doing? I said, well, you said you wanted to talk to me, and I didn't want to be distracted. I learned while we were gone last week that I need to pay attention to what you have to say, and I'm here to fully listen. Well, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> I don't even remember what I was going to tell you. But this is great. We sat there and carried on a conversation. It's amazing, it's amazing how some things seem to work. I love what certain things do for me, but I hate what they do to me. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I'm, I believe I've got your attention for you to understand, and I, I want to make it clear that you understand this. There are some things I hate. I hate prejudice. I hate racism. I hate poverty. We in America don't really understand poverty. Dave and I were talking this morning, and there's a article out it's hard for us to believe as Americans but the article says if you have ten dollars in your park pocket right now you are wealthier than the than 90 percent of everybody on planet earth if you have ten dollars 
in your pocket right now. You're wealthy. You're in the top 10% of wealth. Everybody in America is wealthy and we don't understand it. Amen, preacher, that was really good. It's true. The internet goes off and we go into panic mode. What's wrong with them? I don't have internet. I, don't have, I got to have service. I can't live without service. Do you know how many people don't even have a clue what internet is? I hate poverty. I'm saying this because here's what I want you to understand. The only thing that's going to motivate us to change the things that we need to change in our lives is we've got to hate it. Somebody asked me why I do some of the things. I hate religion. I hate what religion has done to people. I'm not talking about faith in God. I'm not talking about walking with God. I'm not talking about the love of God. I'm talking about what people do. All of our major wars are religious wars. I hate judgmentalism. I hate bullying. Have you ever been bullied? I hate it. You have all seen these people get bullied. You know, I'm in a car and, 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 and I can be irate. I can get out of hand in a car. I'll never forget one day I was in a parking lot and a guy took my parking place and I pulled up and blocked him in and I got out of the car. <laughs> Gee, stand up. <laughs> I walked around that car and I said, Hi, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. I'm glad you got that space. <laughs> you understand? I realized this guy could clean my plow. <laughs> I thought, yeah, he ain't going to bully me. I'll find me another spot. <laughs> I'll walk a mile. I don't care. <laughs> but I didn't like bullying. How many of you understand that? Help me, Lord. He said in Psalm 113, 119, verse 113, he said, I hate double-minded. I could go on and on with things that make me feel good. There's times I don't know what a decision makes, but sometimes no decision is a wrong decision. Sometimes indecision can be one of the worst things in the world. Have you ever tried to go out with people who can't make a decision where they want to eat? Where do you want to go? I don't know. I'll go anywhere you want. Where do you want to go? I'm going to go there. Well, let's go over here. No, I don't want to go there, but, but I'll go anywhere else you want to go. Well, let's go. No, I don't really want to go there either. There are times we just, uh, you know, somebody says, well, here's where I'm going. If y'all want to go, come on. And at my house, the question is, are you buying? <laughs> it's amazing how many people will go where you go if you're buying. You know, y'all understand that. Okay, so. Now watch. <clears throat> Today is Resurrection Sunday. We're going to receive communion here in a few moments. And I don't want to take long to say what I want to say, but here's what I want to declare today, this Easter Sunday, 2019. This is Resurrection Reset 2019. It's time for us to decide that I want to incline my heart to the Lord. I'm not asking you to become religious. I'm not asking you to become anything other than just an individual who says, Lord, I want you to have a place in my heart that I can talk with you, that I can walk with you, that I can share with you, I want to incline my heart to the Lord.
I can look at you this morning and say, I'm going to love God from now on. I'm going to love His Word. Maybe the reason God lets some of us get so low is so that we will hate where we are and what we've done so that we realize He's got something better for us. I hate complaining. I hate bullying. I hate certain things in my life because I realize God didn't design you and I to be in a position where He can't help us. So today we're going to hit a reset button. Another question I have today is, do you know where to hide when you need to hide? Don't look at me and tell me you don't hide because everybody hides. It's amazing what we use to hide. Some of us hide with our enemies. A lady walked up to me one day and she said, you know, I don't understand with all the problems you deal with and how you handle everybody, I don't understand why you don't have a drinking problem. <laughs> what she was telling me was that she hid in a bottle. Do you understand that? See, here's what happens when you need a place to hide and you don't know where to hide, you'll run to your enemy to hide. See, self-pity is your enemy, but when you get down and when somebody says something that you don't like and you get down, you'll run to it and you'll hide in it. Complaining can be a place you hide. What do you mean? Well, you don't want to put on something false. You want to go out, don't want to go out and act like you're somebody that's nice. You're not trying to put on, instead of being like Jesus, you want to put on all these things and we wear all these things and act all these ways and behave all these ways because it's something that we, we don't know where to hide. In Psalm 119, verse 14, he says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Do you know where to run when attacks come? Have you all ever watched these movies where these guys who are really, you, you know, who, who do things, who conquer things, where they have a safe place in their house, where they have like a bookcase that moves and they go in and they hide behind a bookcase or they have a, a, a place where they can go down under the thing, you know, and in certain movies through the years you've seen people, you, you know, I mean, I could tell you a variety of movies where, where, where they have hiding places. They have a place where they go where, where people don't know they're there because they hide. And a lot of people, we, we run and we hide. We have hiding places and our hiding place is not the Lord. We hide in a lot of things. See, uh, 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 you, you got to set your hiding place up in advance because if you don't have your hiding place set up in advance, a place to go to when the battle comes or when the confrontation comes or when the, 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 the issue is coming down, if you don't have a place that's prearranged and pre-prepared, you don't have time to run to it, fix a hiding place till you get there. And if you know that the Lord is your hiding place, instead of running away from the Lord when a problem arises or you get in a battle, instead of running away from Him, you, you need to know how to run to Him and hide in His presence. Some people hide in blame. Doesn't matter what they're dealing with, it's never their fault. Their parents were too tough or their parents were too easy. The reason they're always late is the car's fault. You understand what I'm saying? They live in a world and they hide in blame. People blame things all the time. It's the kids. It's the car. It's how I was raised. I blame my parents. If you were raised like me, you'd understand why I'm the way I am. And you live in this world called blame. And when something goes wrong, instead of knowing how to go to the Lord, we go into the blame game. You always have a reason for not 
inclining your heart to the Lord. It's somebody else's fault. It's never your fault. And I'm just looking at you today and I'm saying, listen to what God has to say because what He wants to say to you is, I will be your hiding place. You can come to me when you can't go to anybody else. You can learn how to trust in me and walk in me. And blame is some people's hiding place. What's yours? Some people hide behind low expectations. They don't want to set their expectations very high because if you don't expect much, you can get it. I'm afraid to set my expectations too high. Why? Well, I may not get it, and then I'll be disappointed. And if I set it too high, and, and I'm disappointed, then, then you know, it just, it just I can't stand it. I can't stand to be disappointed. So you set low expectations, and that's why some of us sit here, and we're how we are, and we're happy with how we are. And in our heart, we haven't inclined our heart. We're reclining, saying, this is just how I am. This is where I am. What am I going to do? And today, I'm simply trying to say, everybody learns how to hide. See, if I learn how to hide behind the image I present to you, then I don't have to deal with me. See, if I came out here every week and I was a pastor who had it all together and I didn't tell you my faults and I didn't tell you my flaws, then I could always run and hide behind, well, God's got it all worked out. One of these days when we get to heaven, everything's going to be fine. And I can't get through tomorrow without going to Him and knowing I need to know how to hide in Him. Are you with me? You know, what I believe God is trying to say to us today is, time for you to come out of hiding we living in a day and a time where God is wanting his people to understand he saves flawed people and there ain't nobody at this church that has it all together the latest member that I know that got it all together is John Kelly. Yeah, John's got it together today. Why? Because he stepped out of this body and into the Lord. As long as he's into that body that he's in, he's got problems with his flesh, with who he is. So I'm just simply saying we've all got things we've got to deal with. And I'm trying to just get us to see today that it's time to hit the Reset button. There it is. What are you saying? Pastor, what do you mean? Come out of wherever you are. Today we're going to hit reset. We've got to know how to have hope. It's the only way I know to say it. Now here's what I want to do as I close this message. My hope for you to change isn't really in you. All I'm asking you to do today is to allow the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit to come into your heart and you just incline your heart to the Lord. You just incline your heart to the Lord. A few weeks ago, Judy Tucker come to me and she said, Pastor, as I was coming around the corner and walking by the communion, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, do this in remembrance of who I am, not who you are or aren't. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When we receive the cup, the juice, it represents the blood 
that was shed for the entire sins of the world. And that blood cleanses us from all sin. So any sin active or going on instantly resets. The wafer, the piece of bread, is the broken body of Jesus. And when you receive his body that was broken, it clearly says in 1 Corinthians 11, it was broken for you. He took stripes on his body, on his back, for your healing. He went to the cross for you. And today, I'm just simply saying, let's reset our hearts towards the Lord. Steve, I'm going to ask you all, if you will, our musicians to come. Don, I'm going to ask our ushers to get the communion elements. We're going to serve you right where we are. And while they're getting ready, I want to continue. While you're being served, we're going to serve everyone that will participate and I want everyone to participate that will and then we're 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 going to pray but I, I, I want you to receive the elements and just hold them until we're ready and here's here's what I want to talk about in closing is I want to talk about hope everybody say hope y'all go ahead get started get everybody served and then we will pray before we participate See, I believe God wants to open your heart today to new possibilities. I believe God wants you to recognize that He wants to be alive inside of you. But you're going to have to put your hand to whatever it is you're hoping for. Coming up here? Yeah, come on. Okay. Did Charlotte bring a wafer? Okay. Just go ahead and sing a little bit, Steve, would you? I guess my mind.
bread. We need bread on the platform. Do you have any bread? Friday afternoon, we were in the foyer finishing everything up, trying to get everything done, working on things, and I tried to call Travis, and I couldn't hear anything. I could look at the phone and realize it's on. I tried to call Sheila, looked at the phone. They were trying to call me back. And I realized I've done something. I'm going to have to go to another phone and, and do something because my phone's not working. I called John uh, Montgomery. We were out here, and of course, I said, John, call me back. Call, let, me, let, me, let me call me back. We just kept trying to get my phone to work, and I thought, man, I'm going to have to buy another phone. At staff meeting that morning, I'd made some kind of a joke about something. What was it? You remember? How anointed you are. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about something, and I said to the staff, I said, well, I'm just anointed to do that. You all aren't anointed, you know, and I made this big thing. So I pick up the landline, and I call Steve, and I said, Steve, he's our technical guy, you know. My phone won't work. He said, turn it off and turn it back on. It will reset. And then he said, I'm anointed for this. <laughs> I believe what the Lord was saying to us in that was, I want to reset everything in your life with me. There's nothing that you're carrying that you need to be carrying. There's no pain. There's no sin. There's no hurt. There's no shame. There is nothing that you're carrying that I haven't already So today, I'm asking you to do a resurrection reset. I'm saying, Lord, you know, I think of all the times I've failed you and all the times I've made mistakes and all the times I did something I shouldn't have done that I knew better and all of the times I behaved in ways I shouldn't have behaved, all of the stuff. And if you're not careful, you start carrying all this garbage with you that you don't need to be carrying. We live in woulda, coulda, shoulda. We live in the blame. We talk about all the other things instead of coming to the place where we say, He bore my sins, my transgressions. He carried all my sorrows. 
I am healed. I am whole. I worship God. So today, I just come before you, Lord, for this congregation and this moment and this time when we need to reset our resurrection power. Lord, when we accepted you as our Savior, resurrection grace went into operation. You forgave us of our sins, and immediately you wrote our name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But Father, we have picked up through all kinds of reasons. We could blame a lot of things. We could blame a lot of people. We could blame our nation. We could blame the world. We could blame the devil. We could blame all kinds of things. But the blame game is over. And today, I want to reset my life in you. And I want your resurrection life living in my heart. I want my heart inclined toward you. Lord, as we receive this bread that represents your body that was broken for us and this juice that represents the blood that you shed for us, may this act of communion reset and restore everything that you've done in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I ask you to receive this bread, which represents the body of Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. Take, eat this in his name. This cup represents the blood of Jesus, which is the new covenant of our relationship with him that he shed his blood for the remission of sins. And all of our sins have been washed in his blood. So receive this cup now, representing the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Receive it in Jesus' name. Would you just do this with me? And I know this is uncomfortable, some of you, but would you just lift your hands a little bit like this, face your palms up, and just say, Lord, I receive your forgiveness right now. Say that with me, would. Lord, I receive your forgiveness. Lord, I receive new life. I receive you, Lord Jesus, into my heart afresh and anew. And then if you would, say this with me. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth one more time I shall bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth we thank you Lord amen amen Thank you for being here today. I appreciate you so much. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus is alive in you. And I want you to just incline your heart to the Lord. Amen. It's resurrection day. So come alive. Be alive in Christ.